should be visible on camera throughout the hearing. And for members participating in person, masks are optional as per the Office of Attending Physician. Uh, members are responsible for controlling their own microphones. Members participating remotely uh, may be muted by staff only to avoid inadvertent background noise. And as a reminder, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository to sccc.repository at mail.house.gov. Finally, members or witnesses experiencing any technical problems. Recording stopped. Recording in inform, progress. Should inform committee staff immediately. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this hybrid hearing on confronting climate impacts, federal strategies for equitable adaptation and resilience. Uh, first, let me say that our hearts are with the people of Ukraine uh, this morning who are living through unimaginable circumstances. And as Democrats, as Republicans, as Americans, we stand on the side of freedom and democracy. And I know we'll work together to hold Russia and Putin accountable and to support the brave Ukrainian people. And as we uh, continue to help the people of Ukraine, we must also keep working to respond to the worsening impacts of the climate crisis. Today, we will hear about the need to develop a national adaptation and resilience strategy that focuses on way to activate all sectors and levels of government to deliver actionable climate risk, science, information, and tools while also helping drive uh, the funding and investment for vulnerable communities. So I'll recognize, recognize myself right now for a five-minute opening statement. For decades, scientists have warned us that our reliance on fossil fuels is filling the atmosphere with heat-trapping pollution, raising global temperatures, and fueling extreme weather. They warned us that rising temperatures would lead to worsening disasters, stronger heat waves, and longer droughts. And those predictions are now our reality. Families and businesses are dealing with the costs and the consequences of climate inaction. And while we can still avoid the worst effects of climate change, some effects now are unavoidable. But it's not too late, however, to avoid some of the worst scenarios if we act now. Uh, while we take ambitious steps to keep climate change from getting worse, we must also urgently confront the impacts that are already here. That means developing a national adaptation and resilience strategy, one that delivers actionable tools and resources to frontline communities across America. It means taking global action to helping communities develop climate resilient economies. It means safeguarding our food and our farmers. And it means investing in strengthening housing and infrastructure directing growth towards safer ground, and prioritizing investments to our most vulnerable people. We must engage in the adaptation planning designed with local partners, uh, engaging them early and meaningfully so that we can benefit from their insight and experience. And we must do this in ways that are equitable, sustainable, and urgent. It's one thing to read about climate impacts in a scientific report. It's quite another to feel them in your own neighborhood. Uh, but that's what's happening across America. Just last year, climate-fueled disasters affected one in 10 American homes, according to an analysis by CoreLogic. And in the summer, the Pacific Northwest experienced a deadly heat wave with record-shattering temperatures of more than 110 degrees. The Southwest is in the midst of a 20-plus year mega drought the region's most severe in the last 1,200 years. And over the next 30 years, the National Ocean Service estimates that flooding will be 10 times as common in communities like my own in the Tampa Bay area where sea level could rise as much as 12 inches. The latest report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change presents one of the starkest warnings to date. Even if we meet our most ambitious climate goals, the world's leading scientists predict that we will suffer losses. We may lose most of the world's tropical coral reefs by the end of the century, as well as much of our glaciers and polar ice. We will continue to lose species and ecosystems at a rapid clip. 
And if we don't act decisively, we'll face widespread human suffering with destabilized food production, water scarcity, and, global, and a global economy plagued by uncertainty. It's a dire economic picture that we simply cannot allow to happen. However, the IPCC report also contains a message of hope and of urgency. Every dollar we spend today on adaptation and resilience can save us between four and seven dollars in the future. And investing in resilient infrastructure can save lives and lessen the impacts of extreme weather. That's why we work to pass President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure law, which includes the largest investment in resilient physical and natural infrastructure in American history. The infrastructure law invests over $50 billion to protect against droughts, heat, floods, and wildfires. It includes $1 billion for FEMA's building resilient infrastructure in communities, as well as $3.5 billion for flood mitigation assistance. And it makes historic investments in wildfire resilience, water infrastructure, transportation planning, and grid resilience. But there's still progress to, to be made because today, uh, the United States has no comprehensive federal approach uh, for climate adaptation and resilience planning that, that builds on what's happening at the local level. The results of an inefficient ad hoc system will exacerbate the risks in our local communities. It'll exacerbate risks to our economy and the people we represent. So today we'll hear from experts on how Congress can help Americans adapt to climate impacts in a way that's equitable for every community. We'll talk about the tools needed to help communities manage unavoidable climate impacts, and we'll explore ways to boost resilience across the nation. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Uh, thank you, and at this time, I'll yield five minutes to Ranking Member Graves for his opening statement. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you all for being here, the witnesses and the, and the members. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, resilience, uh, Resilience is important, and and I'm very proud we have a great local leader, Parish President uh, Matt Jewell here from St. Charles Parish. That's our. Uh, the rest of you have counties y'all hadn't caught on yet, um, but he's the leader of of uh, one of our, our units of local government in our counties, uh, and and a guy that was out there um, waist deep, neck deep in water um, for Hurricane Ida, throwing sandbags, trying to save his community. Uh, resilience is absolutely critical in in. Uh, Louisiana, and and he's going to talk today a little bit about risk rating 2.0, about this this uh, change within FEMA that has been made that um, causes extraordinary uh, rate increases in flood insurance. Uh, people in in his community and adjacent communities going somewhere from $560 a year to 7,000, we believe one even $9,000 in a year. Um, I don't know. This is insane what's going on. What we need to be doing is protecting communities. But Madam Chair, I actually want to go in a little bit different direction today. Um, we're sitting here talking about resilience. This is the climate committee. Um, we're supposed to be dealing with climate issues. And all this committee has been doing, all this Congress has been doing, is sitting here talking about how we're going to move to uh, uh, renewable energy solutions. That, that's what we're going to do. We're going to move to renewable energy solutions. We're going we're gonna to chart this new path on energy. Look at what is happening right now. As a result of, of, of completely failed governance, a lack of an energy policy, no isn't an energy policy, opposing everything isn't an energy policy. Look at what's happening today. As a result of all of these people out there saying these things that are not tethered to science, are not tethered to data, and the people in the media that are being entirely complicit with it. It's not funny anymore. We've reached maximum gasoline prices. Emissions are going up. We're, we're going from buying oil from Russia to, oh, look, we're going to pivot to Iran and Venezuela. I have people calling me, in fact, including people that are constituents of President Jewell. They're saying, I can't afford to fill my car to go to work. It's not funny. You're not achieving any objectives that you're trying to achieve, none. Emissions are going up as compared to President Trump. Prices are insane and we have energy insecurity. The, there is not an energy strategy. We need to be talking about something that is rational, something that is science-based, and we're not. 
we're, we're continuing to talk about how you're going to ride the unicorn to the dance with Bigfoot. This is insane. It doesn't make any sense. We have 38 billion barrels of reserves in the United States, 38 billion barrels of technically proven reserves of oil. We have our European friends that have made dumb decisions like closing nuclear plant after nuclear plant, therefore becoming more dependent upon Russia. We have natural gas here. We have trillions and trillions of cubic feet of natural gas that, that we can produce here. We can, if, if the Biden administration will approve more of the export terminals, we can send that over to Europe to help address their issues. Here is a fact that have said in this committee over and over again, producing gas, natural gas in the United States has a lower environmental footprint, lower emissions than virtually any other country in the world. Do you know the production in the United States that's effectively the cleanest, the lowest emissions? It's producing in the offshore, off the coast of where uh, President Jewell represents, the area where we represent. Lowest emissions in the world, some of the lowest emissions. But no, we're gonna turn to Vladimir Putin, we're gonna turn to Iran, we're gonna turn to Maduro in Venezuela. We're going to turn to the Saudis. Who thinks this makes sense? We have higher prices, higher emissions, and less energy security. This guts our economy. There's not a strategy. No, it's not a strategy. Back to the offshore production. What was one of the first actions of this administration? Signing an executive order saying we're not going to do any new leases. So now there's a, a lawsuit. It got, they told them they had to do it, then told they don't have to do it. And the administration's just sitting there on it. We have the solutions in the United States. At the State of the Union address the other night, the president said, we want to buy America. We want to buy America or American. We have energy right here. We had energy security. We had energy independence, and it was given up through a failed strategy. I want to be clear, Madam Chair. I'm not in any way saying solar, wind, nuclear, hydro, geothermal, wave, all of them play a role, every single one of them. But no is not an energy strategy. And look at what we're doing to this country. This is a disaster. And this shouldn't be a partisan fight. But we can't continue to sit around here and talk about things that are completely illogical, irrational, and are causing the impact to the American people that we're seeing today. Yield back. All right, I thank the gentleman from Louisiana. Uh, by the way, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our witnesses, but we will be uh, going into recess at some point because we're going to take a, a vote today on banning oil and gas <laughs> exports from Putin, from Russia. Can't, so I know you you may want to you wait. may want to correct your remarks when you say we're we're dealing oh, with Putin and oil and gas because we are going to ban oil and gas exports, just like President Biden. Okay, so I want to welcome our witnesses today. We have an outstanding panel. Uh, Dr. William Selecki is a professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Science at the Hunter College in the City University of New York. Uh, an expert in um, urban environmental change, uh, resilience, and adaptation, Dr. Selecki founded the CUNY Institute for Sustainable Cities, which works to make cities part of the solution to sustainability challenges. He was an author of the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Working Group 2 Summary for Policymakers and Chapters on Climate Risk to Cities, and a coordinating lead author of the U.S. National Climate Assessment Chapter on Urbanization, Infrastructure, and Vulnerability. Dr. Laura Hansen is the Executive Director and Chief Scientist at EcoAdapt. Dr. Hansen leads EcoAdapt's work to support professionals in adaptation and management sectors. She serves on the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and is a United States Environmental Protection Agency bronze medalist. Dr. Hansen previously worked as the Chief Climate Change Scientist for the World Wildlife Fund, where she created their International Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation Program. Would you like to uh, introduce Mr. Drew? Sure. Um, Madam Chair, we're, we're joined uh, again by uh, St. Charles Parish President Matt Jewell. Um, President Jewell, I'll, I'll remind you again, we have parishes in Louisiana, not counties. He is the chief executive elected official uh, for the for the parish, um, uh, President Jewell grew up uh, in in uh, St. Charles Parish. Um, he actually worked up here and did uh, staff work with Congressman Scalise. Worked for the United States Department of Energy. Um, is a, is a fellow beekeeper, um, uh, and uh, and and I'll tell you, just a just a great guy uh, that has his heart and soul, complete passion 
uh, for the parish and compassion for the people that he represents. And uh, I think you'll see in his testimony today uh, what a great resource and perspective uh, he'll be providing to the committee. Thank you. And, and Dr. Lauren Alexander Augustine is the executive director of the Gulf Research Program at the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. An expert in water, natural disasters, and resilience, Dr. Augustine currently oversees the management and use of criminal settlement funds directed to the National Academies from the Deepwater Horizon disaster. She previously led efforts to build community resilience at the Resilient America program and as the country director for the African Science Academy Development Initiative. Welcome to all of our panelists, and without objection, the witnesses' written statements will be made part of the record. With that, Dr. Selecki, you are now recognized to give a five-minute presentation of your testimony. Welcome. Great. Uh, thank you. Can you guys hear me? Great. Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. So, um, Chair Castor and uh, <clears throat> Ranking Member Graves and members of the Select Committee, uh, thank you for inviting me today. And uh, thank you for your commitment to the climate change issue. Um, what I'm going to do is speak about the uh, the report and some of the uh, the findings from it. Um, a key uh, statement that come that comes out of the uh, summary for policymakers from that report released last week is that the cumulative evidence of um, the cumulative scientific evidence is unequivocal. Climate change is a threat to human well-being and the health of the planet. Any further delay in concerted global action will miss a uh, brief and rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. Um, the report content really highlights uh, an advanced understanding of climate change driven impacts, including many significant shifts that increase the risks faced by the world's ecosystems and society. Simply put, climate change at the national and global scales is not something that can be ignored, is not going away, and the impacts are going to become increasingly worse. But um, as was noted, we have a clear, we have a window, a clear window of opportunity to act, um, particularly in this next, uh, in this next decade. The, rep the report presents a clear and compelling assessment of widespread global impacts of climate change. Evidence also continues to strengthen the assessment that the impacts will increase significantly if and when global warming exceeds 1.5 degrees Celsius, or about 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit with approximately about 1.1 degree of warming already observed. Um, for North America, some of the key impacts observed in the report include the following. Climate change has neg negatively impacted human health and well-being. Food production is increasingly affected by climate change. Extreme events and climate hazards are, are adversely affecting economic activities across the US and have disrupted supply chain infrastructure and trade. North, North American cities and settlements have been impacted increasingly by severe and frequent climate hazards and extreme events, which have contributed to infrastructure damage, livelihood losses, damage to heritage resources, and safety concerns. Terrestrial, marine, and freshwater ecosystems are all being profoundly altered by climate change across the region. Now, the report also uh, assesses what to expect in the near future in terms of um, uh, future risk, but also talks more specifically about where and why adaptation uh, is being effective or not. Um, and one of, one of the things that is um, um, really relevant here is that there is some good news. The good news is that more and more adaptation strategies are being planned, implemented, um, developed and, and implemented. Many pilot projects and local experiments are ongoing in various types of infrastructural apologies, infrastructural, technological, and societal um, uh, ecosystem-based adaptations um, are, are being developed, which provide a basis for ongoing improvement and scaling up. Also, many enabling factors that promote adaptation have been defined in the assessment as well. These include um, uh, a focus on inclusive governance, uh, access to financing, uh, access to new and, and cutting edge knowledge, as well as decision making that focuses on issues of, of equity. The bad news, though, is that um, what we also find with respect to adaptation is that in some cases, it's not sufficient to meet the challenge of, of climate change, what we define as an adaptation gap. In other cases, it's leading to unintended outcomes or maladaptation. 
Also, we find that a lot of adaptation lacks coordination, monitoring, and evaluation. And in some cases, it's losing its effectiveness with respect to um, shifts in climate change already ongoing. What I'd like to do in my last minute or so is to sort of talk about some of these opportunities for, um, for taking advantage of, the, of this window that we now have present to us. One is to enhance um, conditions for, um, for enabling conditions for adaptation. Two, to focus on enhancing synergies and co-benefits of, adap of adaptation and reduce um, maladaptation, enhance our monitoring and evaluation capacity, incorporate adaptation into the everyday practice, particularly with the development of sector and geographic specific relevant metrics and standards and codes, prepare for shocks that are in some cases outside the remit of our jurisdictional, um, uh, uh, the jurisdiction of agencies and learn from them as best as possible. And then we're also um, develop a, a suite of policies that are flexible, adaptive, and, and also present a, a diverse set of strategies. And finally, one of the key results is this issue of more fully integrating and connecting adaptation and mitigation and development and the recognition that this sort of interleaving of these three key, uh, key, key aspects provide great opportunities for solutions, uh, for climate solutions in, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Selecki. Next, Dr. Hansen, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, to Good morning. Your testimony. Welcome. Good morning, and thank you, Chair Castor, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the Select Committee for inviting me to speak on federal strategies for climate change adaptation. I've had the honor to visit the Hill to discuss climate change three times before. First, in 2004, pregnant with my son, I shared hopeful examples of climate change adaptation from around the world and urged action to keep climate change to less than two degrees Celsius because adaptation and mitigation are both necessary to solve the climate crisis. Back then, I joked with colleagues that all the practitioners in our field could fit in one elevator. In 2007, I was invited back to testify on the effects of climate change on marine ecosystems. My son was three years old. I applauded Congress for penning several bills to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I repeated the need to keep climate change to less than two degrees Celsius and added a request for the creation of a national adaptation policy with an extension agency to provide technical support. The following year, two colleagues and I founded EcoAdapt, a nonprofit devoted to innovating and supporting implementation of adaptation in the United States, a kind of ad hoc extension agency. In 2019, I was invited back to speak on opportunities for adaptation on our public lands. I again requested that we work to keep climate change to less than two degrees Celsius and create a national adaptation plan with an extension agency. By this time, EcoAdapt was running the world's largest online adaptation database, kkex.org, and the National Adaptation Forum, which had over 1,200 participants that year. The field was now more people than could fit in an elevator, but still not big enough to meet the scale of the challenge we face. By the way, the forum will be in Baltimore this October. I hope that some of you can attend and share the progress that you're making on climate change. In each of your districts, decisions made every day are vulnerable to climate change. If these decisions are not evaluated through a climate lens, we will end up with failed infrastructure, risking lives and livelihoods, damaging our environment, and hindering our ability to thrive economically, socially, and ecologically. Simply put, explicit consideration of climate change in our actions today is vital for our lives tomorrow. As lawmakers, you have the power to do something about this. Based on over 20 years of professional experience in the field of adaptation, I recommend the following. One, create and implement a national adaptation plan that requires the evaluation of climate change impacts on all funding and regulatory decisions. Two, create a national adaptation and mitigation extension agency to provide technical support to public and private parties at the federal, state, and local levels be it a national climate service or an effort being developed by NOAA called the Climate Smart Communities Initiative, whatever its name, it should be sufficiently funded to coordinate and leverage existing public and private adaptation tools and resources to build capacity and deliver climate information to user communities. Three, require that Congress and all federal agencies undertake their mission with an awareness that the climate is changing. This means agencies entrusted to protect our people and resources must evaluate climate change vulnerability such that they can act to reduce climate risk. That should be how we do business. We must ensure that the most vulnerable communities and individuals are given additional attention to ensure our country does not have climate winners and losers. 
We all have the right to be protected from the harms of climate change, regardless of our race, gender, or economic status. We must recognize the interconnectedness of systems. Cities cannot exist without water, energy, and food, which comes from the natural systems that surround them. This requires holistic plans that include protecting adequate and appropriate space for ecosystems to function under changing conditions. We must ensure that agency and congressional staff have the training to understand climate change when doing their jobs. Without that, we cannot expect our federal government to take effective action. Four, reevaluate acceptable levels of non-climate stresses. The effects of pollutants and other environmental and community stresses can be compounded by climate change. We need to ensure that regulatory and planning responses take that into account so that we can achieve our desired goals to protect the health of people and the environment. And of course, since my child is now a teenager, I often know that I need to repeat myself to get action, such as, please empty the dish rack. So here it goes. Five, please keep global climate change to well below two degrees Celsius. Actually, we now know that 1.5 degrees Celsius is a more prudent target. We need to reduce our consumption of fossil fuels to stop making the problem worse. The cost of inaction is unaffordable for us and our children. My son is now a high school junior, making plans for college and a career path. He says he's interested in climate science. <laughs> for his future and that of all of our children, I cannot properly articulate the hope that I entrust in this Congress and this, this committee. Please take action to increase our likelihood of good outcomes. This and every future generation is depending upon you. I hope that my son is not on the Hill in 10 years with the same list of requests. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. Uh, next, Mr. Jewell, you are recognized for five minutes. Welcome. Good morning, Chairman Kasser, Ranking Member Graves, members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to appear in front of you today. <clears throat> my name is Matthew Jewell, and I'm the president of St. Charles Parish, Louisiana. Southeast Louisiana is an incredible place to live. Its natural beauty, rich resources, and the economic engine that is the Mississippi River provide the foundation of our $87 billion economy. However, what truly makes Louisiana incredible is her people. Louisianans are some of the most resilient people you will ever meet. For centuries, they've called Louisiana home and they've stood steadfast as they've faced hurricanes, land loss, and now a global pandemic. Through it all, Louisianians continue to rebuild, adapt, and overcome despite the challenges. Southeast Louisiana's economy accounts for about 36% of the state's total GDP. Last year, we exported, exported $105 billion of goods and services from the region. The state, ranks, the state ranks third in the U.S. in natural gas production, and it, uh, it, it has 20% of the nation's oil refining capacity. In St. Charles Parish alone, we have 14 industrial sites ranging from oil and gas, chemical, and even a nuclear power plant, which produces 1.1 gigawatts of carbon-free electricity, which is enough to power over 750,000 homes. Most recently, Louisiana was devastated by Hurricane Ida, a strong category four hurricane. Our communities came together with our industry partners. We picked up the pieces and we're getting back to work. This is what we do. Nevertheless, it's getting more difficult to be resilient due to policies coming out of Washington, DC. Bureaucratic hurdles have made it increasingly difficult and costly to construct flood protection and coastal restoration projects. Additionally, Additionally, new policies around FEMA's flood insurance program have begun to put an economic constraint on people living in the region. To reverse these impacts, we must begin by cutting the red tape on coastal restoration projects designed to restore our wetlands to their natural state in time is of the essence. Since the 1930s, Louisiana has lost more than 2,000 square miles of land, an area roughly the size of Delaware. To solve this, we need an all of the above approach to coastal restoration, which involves dredging, Marsh, marsh restoration, shoreline protection, and where they work, freshwater and sediment diversions, to restore the natural process which created the land where we live. Passing legislation such as the Bipartisan Shore Act will allow places like Louisiana, like Louisiana to continue to advance critical storm protection and coastal restoration priorities for our vulnerable communities and habitats. The Shore Act puts into law that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers shall prioritize coastal restoration and el eliminate the legal and regulatory hurdles that have caused delays in implementing these types of projects. Raising or eliminating the cap on Go Mesa revenues would provide the funding needed to make these projects a reality, as it is currently the only is the is currently the state's only consistent for funding source for the coastal program. As we discuss resiliency, we must also consider economic resilience. FEMA's risk rating 2.0 puts in an unbearable financial burden on homeowners. Under FEMA's new risk rating policy, we have seen new home policies that were traditionally as low as $600 jump up upwards of $8,500. 
these increases coupled with the highest inflation our nation has seen since 1982 is not economically sustainable. We need more investment in flood protection to mitigate risks, not policies that are going to force Americans to abandon their homes. Federal investment like pro in projects like the Upper Barrett Area Risk Reduction System will protect hundreds of thousands of people, property, and billions of dollars of infrastructure vital to our national economy. The Corps of Engineers Chief's report says the benefits produ produced by this project are cost effective. However, on the other hand, FEMA's flood insurance policies threaten to, threaten to force people out of the area. We have seen flood protection projects like these work firsthand. I agree with, the sec with section SPM.C.2.1 of the most recent IPCC report, which indicates that, quote, structural measures like levees have reduced the loss of lives, and that by, quote, enhancing natural water retention, such as by restoring wetlands and rivers, can reduce flood risk. In closing, Southeast Louisiana is a critical part of our national economy. Together, local, state, and federal governments can work to ensure we focus make, on making changes that will complement the resilient people of Louisiana. And I thank you for your time, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Next, uh, Dr. Augustine, you are recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Welcome. Is that better? Okay, thank you for inviting me to testify today. Um, my name is Lauren Alexander Augustine, and I'm the executive director of the Gulf Research Program at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. The Academies has done much work on climate issues that may be of use to this committee, but today um, the views I represent are, are, are my own. So equity, resilience, and adaptation, these are important and pressing issues of our Time. And I'm going to talk about three things in, in the four minutes and 30 seconds left. I'm going to talk about the interconnected pieces that drive resilience, what resilience is and how it works, and the fierce urgency of now. So the interconnected pieces are the environment, the economy, and the people, just as Mr. Jewell just said. And on the environment, the scientific consensus is unequivocal. The climate change is a threat to human well-being and planetary health, but we can see some of these changes for ourselves just over the past few years. Storms have been getting more frequent, more intense, more expensive. Hurricane season in 2020 was the most active in U.S. history. Hurricanes Michael in 2018 and Ida in 21 were the two of the five strongest storms in U.S. history. And now 2017 is the most expensive hurricane season in U.S. history, removing 2005 with Katrina, Rita, and Wilma and pushing that to second. So these hurricanes mostly happen in the Gulf of Mexico, where oil and gas is an economic powerhouse for the region and the country. And in all of my community resilience work, one thing is true. A healthy economy is foundational for resilience. So in 2019, almost all of the offshore oil and gas in the US came out of the Gulf of Mexico. More than half of the natural gas and about half of the, net of the nation's crude oil are produced in that region. Even still, we see Louisiana and Texas planning to greatly reduce their greenhouse, em greenhouse emissions and dependence on fossil fuel. In fact, Louisiana pub just published its first climate action plan last month to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions for the entire state economy. As these changes occur, we must ensure that the economic engines remain strong. And then there are the people. Climate change is a threat and risk multiplier. This means that they magnify the inequities that already exist in society on race, income, language, mobility, such that those who are disadvantaged, they see their disadvantages compound when disasters strike. There are other vulnerabilities as well. 100 million people live on the coast in the, in the US, 60 in the path of, of, of hurricanes. And people continue to move to the coasts. Um, so we see these kind of stack up in pricey ways. The five states around the Gulf of Mexico, Texas, Texas Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida, they account for more than 60% of the disaster re relief funds in the whole country. So if we can find a workable balance in this region, we can find a solution for the country. So what is resilience? In my view, resilience is like a zipper. And we've heard about the pieces here, the economy, the people, the data. But when all of this is undone, they don't do much good to anybody. It's when they're connected that it turns into something useful, strong, 
and protective. So the environment, the energy, there's like teeth on a zipper. And the, the top end is like the federal resources and authorities, but it's the base of the zipper, the part that gets it all started, it's the local communities. And so the GRP specifically in science kind of more generally, we're like the slider and the pull that connects the local communities to the federal resources and vice versa. So we did this in uh, November 21, just a couple months ago. We organized what we called a serious game around federal investments on infrastructure for more resilient infrastructure in the Gulf of Mexico. And we brought the local Gulf experts together with federal uh, representatives to address questions like bang for your buck on federal investments on infrastructure. And how do we work with federal funds to make sure public asset, or private assets don't become public liabilities? It was a really successful event, and we're going to run it again in the, in the Gulf region this spring, because we need these examples of effective connections across science, across communities, and across the federal agencies. So in my last 30 seconds, let me just talk about the, this fierce urgency of now. Dr. Selecki and everyone on the panel thus far has talked about this, this window is closing. But I just want to kind of emphasize that if it's closing, it means it's still at least a little bit open. And so we can act and we can act now. And the future generations are depending on what we do today. They're going to look, they're going to know what we knew, when we knew it, how we chose to act. And we could wait and take no action, or we could start now to ensure equity and resilience for all. We have strong science. We have a once in a generation opportunity of an infusion of resources. And we have a collective motivation to design communities, energy, economies that bend towards resilience for all. We want, in other words, in 100 years, the people of that time to look back on us today and say that we did the right thing. I thank you very much for this opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Now we'll move to member questions. I'll recognize myself for five minutes for the first round. Uh, thank you all for your outstanding testimony. and. Uh, Dr. Augustine, you're, you're right to highlight what the IPCC, uh, the world's top scientists, re recently said in that last report. It was eye-opening that there is a rapidly closing window for us to act. And I love what you highlighted that um, there are such knowledgeable people all across the country in communities that are ready to look for the best bang for the buck. We don't have unlimited resources to do this. We've got to be smart and targeted, and right now, uh, climate and adaptation planning across the country is done on an ad hoc basis. It's very inefficient. So as Dr. Hansen has said, has given us some good recommendations. I've seen, uh, I've traveled to, to Norfolk at the invitation of uh, Congresswoman Elaine Luria and Don McKeachin and Bobby Scott, and they have a, they're kind of leading the way on their community planning. In the Tampa Bay area at home, we are. I've seen Miami Day, but there are so many communities that do not have the resources. They 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 may they don't even have a they're not going to have a planner. They may not have you know a, even a chief of police. They and they're the ones that really need help. So let me start with Dr. Hanson, and I'll go back to Dr. Augustine. We've put in some money in the bipartisan infrastructure uh, law for FEMA building resilient communities. But we don't want to be in emergency response mode. We want to be proactive uh, up front. What's the proper structure? What agencies need to be involved? And then how do we empower communities across the country? This cannot be top down. It has got to be from the bottom up, listening to folks like, like Mr. Jewell and other local officials and experts on, on how we plan to, to adapt. What do you say, Dr. Hanson? Thank you. Um, this really needs to be an across government approach. Um, every agency needs to be requiring that for federal dollars to be spent, that the climate risk was evaluated and the spending that is taking place is in fact not dramatically vulnerable to climate change. Um, but that also is going to require local planning that has that as its climate lens as well. So we absolutely don't want it to come to FEMA having to do the repairs. Um, fortunately, FEMA now has a different course of action than it used to. Previously, FEMA would require that you build back in the same location the same way right. in order to get those funds. 
Um, we need to make sure that everything that we're doing from here forward is climate smart um, and that it is uh, built to last. So that has to be literally across the board, every agency, everything they're doing. Okay, and Dr. Augustine, thank you for your work in the wake of uh, the worst environmental economic a catastrophe, the Deepwater Horizon. I, I still remember it very well, even though oil didn't wash up on the, the coast of Florida and my neck of the woods, boy, the, it devastated our economy. Uh, and we're still living with the environmental impacts as well. So climate change is, is similar. It's out there, it's causing uh, horrendous damage, raising costs. We know we have to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels over time, but we have to adapt as well. What do you, what's going on at the local level? What do you recommend to us to empower local communities so that we do have that, that grassroots uh, approach that they are making the decisions on, on when funding comes down to, to adapt? Uh, how do we make sure that they are kind of leading the way while federal resources flow from agencies? I think this is a great question and I, I I would say that the appetite is very strong at the local level. Um, it's amazing the public servants like Mr. Jewell and, and others at this local level really want better information. They want actionable information. They want me and my science community to provide information that they can use, that can be understood, that relates to where they live. Um, not to put words in your mouth, Matt, but um, this is what we hear. and and so. One of the things that um, comes to mind is that we do start at that local level to the degree that we can. And um, in my experience, there's many communities that are crying out for help. Um, they, want, they want some people to help them interpret data, translate information that seems quantitative or even confusing, and they don't know what to do with it. So with that, I think that I can go back to my little zipper analogy because there are, there are a lot of federal resources, um, some, most that come after a disaster. You know, the really long and strong money that comes after a disaster. But if we could find ways to bring in the pre-disaster op options, you know, and it, and it crosses the federal agencies, some in NOAA, some in HUD, some in this, some in DHS. I mean, they're kind of all over the place. Um, but there are, there are abilities to get that mitigation money, that adaptation money, and link that with the post-disaster recovery and relief money. Thank you. Mr. Graves, you're recognized for five minutes. Oh, excuse me. Mr. Carter, good morning. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And let me begin, Madam Chair, by saying that I echo the comments that were made by the ranking member earlier today. And I, I can't help but, but say that what we're going through in this country right now is totally ridiculous. And the ranking member was right. What has it resulted in this, this failed policy of this administration, higher prices, higher emissions, and energy insecurity? All of this did not have to happen. All of this could have been avoided. So again, I just want to say that I echo the comments of the ranking member and thank him for that for those comments earlier. Mr. Jewell, I want to ask you, President Jewell, I apologize. Um, and two Two things I want to disclose before I start. First of all, I was a mayor in another life. I served local level, I served the state level, now I serve the federal level. So I know exactly what, what you're experiencing here. Secondly, and most importantly, two of the most precious people in my life live in Jefferson County and in Jefferson Parish, excuse yeah. me, in Metairie. Uh, one year old and a three year old, two granddaughters there. So this is very important to me. They just bought a new house in, in Metairie. And I know exactly what you're talking about when you're talking about the price of. Uh, of, of flood insurance. So I, I just want to make that sure you understand where I'm coming from here. You talk about risk rating 2.0 and, and how it will put an unbearable financial burden on homeowners and, and, and actually cost up to, I believe it's 7,000, maybe even $8,500. So you, can you just expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, thank you, Congressman Carter, for that question. And let me just say that St. Charles Parish borders Jefferson Parish. We're about a 10-minute drive from Metairie. And um, what's interesting that we're seeing around these new policies, not just in St. Charles Parish, but in Jefferson Parish, where they're actually protected by the HIDRA system, which is the Hurricane Storm Risk Reduction System that was designed by the Corps of Engineers. It's a 100-year uh, storm protection system. Under the old NFIP, 
that played a very big role under how much you paid for flood insurance. If you're protected for the, from that 100-year storm, um, you, you, aren't, you don't have that same risk. Um, and what we're seeing now is that policies in, in St. Charles, policies in Jefferson, who are even behind that risk reduction system, are seeing these huge hikes. And, um, and what we're seeing is that for new home policies, so um, these policies that were traditionally maybe in an X zone, and for members who don't know, an X zone is, a, is an area on a, on a flood map that is considered uh, to have very little to no flooding risk, usually means you have a higher elevation. We're seeing even policies in those areas um, that were around $500 under the old NFIP system, uh, now as high as $3,500. Uh, so a, a huge jump. And what happens is for people who are planning to build a house, myself included, um, you, you, you can't plan for this change and, and you end up paying tens of thousands of dollars just in insurance and it becomes unaffordable. So uh, we really would love for FEMA to come back to the table and, and work with us on this, uh, on this issue because right now uh, this policy is threatening to um, stop further expansion in this, in this region uh, and for uh, existing policies they're going to start going up. At a tremendous so, so basically what you're talking about is the difficulty in navigating the federal, the federal government and agencies within the federal government. Yes, you know, it's really incredibly hard to um, to to navigate these uh, the, the federal government because they're looking at they're looking at things through different lenses. I mentioned in my uh, in my testimony the paradox between FEMA and the Corps of Engineers. I mentioned a, a 1.5 billion dollar levy project called the Upper Barataria Risk Reduction System, and um, on one hand, the Corps is saying that this 1.5 billion dollar investment is worth it. It actually has a return on an investment of 50 years at $30 million a year. But on the other hand, FEMA is basically saying there's going to be nobody to protect because we're going to force people out of this area. So it's incredibly hard to, to not only to navigate just the, the permitting and the, uh, and the uh, environmental regulations around these projects, uh, but also to have FEMA on top of that pay, making un, un, unaffordable policies uh, on, on our residents. Okay, real quick, I've got about a minute left. Um, in your testimony also, you mentioned nuclear technology in St. Charles Parish. And in my home state of Georgia, um, we're working to get Plant Vogel reactors, the only two reactors um, currently under construction in the United States right now. We're working to get them up and running. Can you talk about the benefits of nuclear energy as part of an overall strategy, an overall strategy for clean energy future? Yes. Yeah, so you know, nuclear has to be a part of our energy mix. In my parish, we have the Waterford 3 nuclear power plant. Right next door, you have Waterford 1 and 2, uh, which are natural gas plants. So those intermittent sources uh, come in and help that baseload source in times of high demand. Um, so just to put in perspective, and, and I, I just find this stat fa fascinating, one uranium fuel pellet, which is the size of about a, of a pencil eraser, is enough uh, to replace one ton of coal. It has the same energy capacity as one ton of coal, 149 gallons of oil, or 17,000 cubic feet of, uh, of natural gas. So uh, Waterford 3 is, uh, in my parish, and it, it, it produces 1.1 megawatts of carbon-free electricity, again, enough to power 750,000 homes. So if we want to reach uh, our climate goals, I'm fine, and, and I think everybody in the country is fine having all the renewable intermittent sources, but you need that uh, that baseload generation, that carbon-free baseload generation of nuclear uh, is uh, to have a robust energy uh, well, energy economy. Thank you very much, and I'll yield back, but thank you, and I'm pulling for you. Next up, uh, Congresswoman Bonamici, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Castor. Thank you to all of our witnesses. We appreciate your, your testimony and your expertise. I, I want to start by noting, especially in response to some uh, of Dr. Augustine's testimony, that yesterday in the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, we heard from NOAA, Department of Energy, NASA, and the GAO, specifically about their adaptation and resilience strategies, including their interagency collaboration and the use of climate data in agency planning, implementation, and outreach. And, there, and I, I just want to put that on the record because there's a, a lot of a, a, a connection with what we're talking about today. Uh, and Dr. Hansen, I wanted to mention that when we when we do this work, we think about our, our children, our own children, but also future generations. Uh, my son, who is now 33, was born just two months uh, after James Hansen, I don't know if you're related, then with NASA testified on the Hill and raising the alarm about anthropogenic climate change. That was in 1988. Uh, and he raised that alarm back then. Uh, so my, my first question, uh, the most recent IPCC report makes it clear that we need immediate 
and significantly bolder and more effective efforts to help communities respond to the climate crisis. Successful adaptation efforts need to be region specific while also incorporating the lessons learned at the state, local, federal and international levels and information sharing is information sharing is really essential. So Dr. Augustine, how can Congress leverage federal resources and knowledge to support what communities on the ground need when it comes to adaptation and climate resilient development? Well, thank you for that question. Um, uh, and there are some options for Congress to be helpful here. I think I, I think that there's a role um, that the local the local levels are looking for some appropriations to get started. Um, I think that there's a lot of interest in getting federal funds in and, and getting applications and proposals written, but in some cases the capacity is missing. And so it, it's very enlightening to see the Justice 40 initiative come through that some of this, some of this mar money is targeted to the historically marginalized communities, but there is, there's a need for some, I would call it almost like startup money. Um, not every community can afford the big consulting firms to get a really good proposal in. And so if there's some, there some funds that are made available for communities to be able to build that capacity and connect uh, their needs with some of the big federal um, resources that are available. I think that would be a really big start. That's a um, great and suggestion. I think that the, yeah, and I think that the last thing um, is just to really encourage some sort of coordination across these federal programs. I mean, like you mentioned, there's the NOAA and there's NASA right, and there's right. all these pieces and it can be confusing and overwhelming. Appreciate um, that. And I don't want to cut you off, but I want to try to get another question in. Yes. Uh, we, we know that the, um, and this can be for Dr. Selecti, Selecti, uh, the populations hardest hit by the climate crisis and with the greatest adaptation challenges are those that have experienced the greatest marginalization. And we know climate change symptoms such as extreme heat and drought disproportionately hurt lower income communities and primarily black and brown communities. So Dr. Selecki, you talked about maladaptation in your testimony. If adaptive planning does not account for inequities, how can that lead to mal? Uh, adaptation. And I want to note that um, in Portland last year, it was 116 degrees. So in answering this question, please use extreme heat as a starting point. Sure. Well, <clears throat> thank you for the question. I, I, the immediate response, which goes back to um, a comment made earlier about uh, climate change being a risk multiplier. So in these communities, marginalized or, or more vulnerable communities, you know, risk is sort of the risk of climate change is it often you know, concatenates with other other risks that we see. Um, and in, tune, in truth, that's how they, um, there, there's a perception that, uh, you know, there are multiple sort of questions and threats sort of facing these communities. So with respect to, um, you know, maladaptation, oftentimes we find, you know, adaptive strategies like urban uh, greening and sort of um, enhancing uh, quality of life in cities, from some, in some cases lead to uh, a green gentrification or sometimes defined as uh, climate gentrification where communities, neighborhoods become more desirable and then turn higher, higher rents, higher rates, um, uh, and then dislocation. So these are just you know, one example that you see with respect to maladaptation and heat mitigation. That's very helpful. And it looks like I'm just about out of time. So I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. At this point, uh, due to votes on the floor, we're going to take a quick recess for 10 minutes so folks can vote on this uh, uh, motion to adjourn. Then we're going to come back and try to keep going before the next round of votes. Committees.
At this time, I'll recognize the ranking member for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I want to I want to respond to your comment earlier about the Russian oil ban. So you're right. There's a bill on the floor that was uh, I think I saw the text on it at 1:30 a.m. Along with text of about it's 17 pages. There's about probably 5,000 pages of text uh, that was dropped last night at 1:30 a.m. Um, that we're going to be voting on today that appropriates approximately a gazillion dollars um, that no one has read, and um, that bill. Um, so so let's 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 talk about give or take. A little bit. Um, so let's talk about those two things real quick. Number one, on, on Russian oil ban. Um, I have proposed amendments to bills um, in the Transportation Committee and the Natural Resources Committee to ban Russian oil now for about three years, and every single Democrat on the committee has opposed that legislation. Um, so, so we're going to we're going to we're going to shut it down now. We're going to ban Russian oil now because it's politically popular. Because what happened was, rather than producing energy domestically, we instead last year nearly tripled the importation of Russian crude oil into the United States. Nearly tripled it, which then funded effectively Putin's aggression in Ukraine. The last time that Putin invaded Ukraine was Crimea. That was back when we were similarly in a Democrat administration and we were similarly uh, dependent upon Russian oil at a, at a peak level. Um, there's, a, there's a trend there, um, Madam Chair. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna ban it, but we're gonna ban it absent any type of strategy to backfill. For, for, for the people that don't do this on a daily basis, Russian oil is a heavier oil. You can't take light oil and send it to a heavy refinery. You can't make some of the products that you make from heavy oil with light oil. There's no backfill strategy. So yes, prices are gonna go up. Yes, this was totally, totally preventable. And, and it's a result of failed or really just no energy strategy. Now let's go over to the 5,000 page appropriations bill. President Jewell, you represent St. Charles Parish, ground zero for some of the incredible devastation uh, from Hurricane Ida. Um, uh, let, me, let me see if I remember this right. So on September 30th, we appropriated funds for 2021 disasters, including Hurricane Ida, about a month after the storm. To date, to date, not one penny of the funds has even been allocated, which simply announces how much of it is going to go to Louisiana for Hurricane Ida. After they announce the allocation, they then have to do a federal register notice that sits out there. You then have to do an action plan on how you're going to spend the funds. The action plan has to be considered and reviewed. Then you can potentially start allocating funds. Let me put it in perspective. In the 2016 disaster, we uh, flood disaster, I think $1.7 billion was appropriated over five years ago to date. 1.7 billion, less than 700 million of it has been allocated to flood victims. Um, so the bill, the, the 5,000 pages includes zero additional funds for Hurricane Ida victims. Our, our Democrat governor in Louisiana asked for approximately $3 billion in funds. How does that make you feel that we're spending money on Haiti, we're giving funds to Ukraine, humanitarian aid, which I support, um, but we're giving nothing to the people that you represent? Well, thank you, Congressman. It's it's incredibly disappointing to hear that. Uh, we definitely support uh, the, the funding going towards Ukraine, uh, but it's incredibly important since we're still in the midst of recovery uh, in Louisiana. We still have people living in temporary housing, people still actively trying to fix their homes, um, that we get the funding necessary um, to, to, to rebuild and to... Uh, to build back in a way that's going to be a little bit more resilient than than, than what we've seen in the past. And uh, to give you an example, we still have hospitals that have temporary roofs on them. We still have government buildings in my parish and other parishes that are have temporary uh, temporary fixes and, and are waiting to, to fully recover. Yep. And you and I met with President Biden, and I want to be clear, I appreciate the president uh, working with us on the first round of funding, but uh, in terms of getting and helping us get in the appropriations bill, but no funds have been actually allocated or made available to, to the people that you represent. So this hearing's about resilience. St. Charles Parish is in the coastal zone under the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act. The parish is eligible for GOMESA aid, for, for aid that is tied directly to energy production. When this administration refuses to do a lease sale, uh, despite court orders at one point, uh, refused to do a lease sale for, for additional offshore energy, which I will reiterate, lowest emissions associated with domestic production, um, your parish doesn't get money for GOMESA. What do you use those funds for? What are you required to use GOMESA funds for under the state's constitution? Yeah, under the state's constitution, uh, GOMESA funds have to go towards things like flood protection and coastal restoration, um, which are, are impacted by things like climate change. Uh, and right now, St. Charles Parish is actually 
uh, is actually actually leveraging the dollars that we do get to to get a bond and, and, and work on uh, projects that are going to protect our so residents. So said another way, the, the lack of energy production, the lack of following the law and doing the lease sales, it makes your parish more vulnerable at a right. time when they're trying to recover. Um, fascinating. Um, uh, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time, but I, but I think it's really important to note the, the relationships there. I want to thank President Jewell, and I do have some questions for the record for you on risk rating 2.0 and the implications of, of your constituents. Thank you for your leadership efforts in fighting that flawed policy. Thank you. Next up, uh, Representative Kasten, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I, I often find myself trying to imagine a situation where every American woke up every morning and got hit in the head with a hammer. And we would, if that happened, we would probably think, you know, we should probably stop hitting people on the head with hammers. Um, alternatively, we could, I don't know, spend a lot of money to invest in helmet technology. And President Jewell, you are dealing with the, the consequences of climate change and the helmets from levees to, to flood insurance and all the things you have to grapple with. And I have a lot of sympathy with my, my friend, Mr. Graves, because he represents a district that, where the economy depends on hammer manufacturing. Um, that's really hard, um, and we've got to grapple with that. But I want to focus on I want to focus on the helmet because that was the subject of your testimony. The IPCC report that recently came out described climate change as um, <clears throat> I think they said the rate of climate change is outpacing our ability to adapt. The NOAA report that just came out said that we've got two feet of sea level rise on the Gulf Coast by 2050. I, I'm just curious, you sitting there as the president of your parish. How many of the homes in your parish are within two feet of sea level? I don't have that number off the top of my head, but uh, we, we do have a, a fair number of homes that are, are, are close to sea level or, um, or just above. Okay, so if, so if I was to move to St. Charles Parish tomorrow and try to get a 30-year mortgage, because by 2050, um, you know, by 2050, that mortgage isn't going to be fully paid off. Could I get a 30-year mortgage if I was to move to St. Charles Parish? You, you absolutely would be able to get a 30-year mortgage, and, uh, but you probably wouldn't be able to afford your flood insurance. Okay, and who's, who's taking the risk of that mortgage? Because if you know it's going to be underwater in 30 years, who's holding that paper? Uh, the banks are. Uh, the Fannie and Freddie or the commercial banks? Commercial banks. I mean, there, there is still active lending going on uh, in, in St. Charles Parish, in coastal Louisiana, because we've made such investments like in levees and flood protection uh, to protect us. But where we're seeing uh, a lot of the inaction are on some of the big coastal restoration projects because of the uh, hurdles that we have to jump through. Do you, do you carry much debt in your parish? Do I carry much debt? No. Yeah. No. If you wanted to go out and get long-term paper, if, you know, if, you've got a, if you've got a road you need to build where the, the cost of recovering that bond is going to get beyond 30 years, can you get that debt? Absolutely. What's happening there? No, absolutely. We, we, just, we just did a bond against our GoMesa revenues um, which is, a, I think, a 30-year payment uh, as well. So, uh, but again, that money is going into things like uh, coastal restoration, flood protection, and things like that. Okay. Well, there was a CFTC report that came out under the Trump administration last year that looked at how financial risk was rippling through our financial sector. And they found that the, they echoed your point that commercial banks are still writing those mortgages, but they are increasingly putting those on to Fannie and Freddie. When I asked Chairman Powell last week if if Fannie and Freddie were changing their risk profiles in response to that, he said, no, but they should. I followed up by saying, okay, everything I know about finance, I spent 20 years in the energy industry. I built a lot of projects, raised a lot of money. Everything I know about finance is it depends on informational asymmetry. Um, you know, the old joke that if you sit at a poker table and you look around and you can't spot the fish, you better leave the poker table because you're the fish. Mm. And what that CFTC report found was that the more likely you are to be in a flood prone region, the more likely the banks are to offload that risk onto Fannie and Freddie. So our failure to remove the hammer is causing the taxpayers to invest more and more in helmets, right? And the, and the fear I have, and I, and I think it goes to what all our witnesses are talking about, is that if we don't think about taking away the hammers, right? If we only focus on the helmets, we simply don't have enough money, right? And, it, and at some point, we're going to have horrible conversations, and the people who are going to lose are going to be the fish, right? The financial sector is going to move, and um, and we got to focus on getting rid of those hammers. And I understand that pain. Um, from a political perspective, with the time we have left, help us understand what happens to you if you don't get the money to invest in those helmets. If you if you have if you have no choice but to tell people. 
all I can do is abandon the, prov the provision of this road. I can't rebuild that school. We can't, we simply can't protect that home. What happens to you politically? Well, I think it's important to know that Louisiana has a plan and that's a very important. We have a, a coastal master plan um, that is a 50 year plan uh, that is rooted in science to rebuild our coast. What we need, what we need is a investment in uh, in coastal restoration projects, which right now comes from the the funding uh, of GoMesa, those those outer continental shelf uh, revenues. That is the only consistent funding source for uh, our coastal plan. So, an in, in investment in that, and in, in things like the Rise Act will uh, will increase that that GoMesa revenue share, and they'll also um, give us a portion of offshore wind lease sales when that becomes viable in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so having that funding source is, is what we need. Uh, we need to increase that funding source, but we also need to eliminate those regulatory hurdles so, so that we can start doing these projects now well, because we're losing over a football field of land every hour. Well, I, I thank you for that, and I'm out of time, but I just, it, when I look at the sea level rise that we know is coming, most of Louisiana south of I-10 is underwater. And I want to make sure that our next redistricting cycle, my friend Mr. Graves is still here and is not sitting there saying that my district is now underwater. I yield back. And, and I've also been um, concerned with, with changes in flood insurance. There's a lot of uncertainty. But the NFIP numbers, the ranking member cited, are, are not exactly accurate. No policies will increase in one year at the rates uh, that he stated from $560 to $7,000 or $9,000 in one year because there are caps. Uh, in the law that prevent these big jumps in cost. Uh, and the, I'm very concerned. I have a coastal district, so uh, we checked it out. The new price methodology and risk rating 2.0 implemented by FEMA in NFIB would help decrease uh, flood insurance premiums because it's based on the, the risk per property rather than by zone. So it makes for a more equitable uh, flood insurance and it will prevent especially lower income households from overpaying. Within my district, 76% of policyholder policy premiums would actually decrease uh, or remain stable under the risk new, the new risk rating 2.0. In ranking member Graves' district, the information we have uh, is that 92.5% uh, of policyholder premiums would decrease or remain stable under risk rating 2.0 with estimated decreases in premiums totaling over $13 million for single family households. And the, the source is uh, the FEMA F NFIP data by Pew and Reinsurance Association of America. Does the gentlelady yield? I'll yield for a second. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I, I, I want to be very clear. Um, a preferred risk policy right now, you can pay between five and $600 a year. Uh, as of October 1st, for any new policies, a new purchase or a new policy, the, if, if you have a home that right now is paying 560 and it is sold, the new purchaser will go to the numbers I cited. You're correct that as of April 1st, um, under the second phase of the program, that, that is when existing policy increases uh, begin moving up. And yes, there is a rate cap of 18% a year. You're going to continue moving toward that higher number. But, but just to be clear, my statement was entirely correct because number one, those who are, who are subject to the 18% cap that on April 1st, they are going to move to that $7,000, $9,000 Recording Secondly, stopped. Those who had a purchase um, or a new policy, they will immediately jump to the no figure to the new figure. There is not a a rate cap per year. You'll bet. Next up, uh, we're going to go to Mr. Huffman. You're recognized for five minutes. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, look before I get into my questions, uh, let me just say that my colleague from Louisiana uh, is a good person. He's a good member of Congress. I consider him a friend. Uh, but it is hard. It is hard to listen to this well-traveled speech he's been given on energy and Putin and related matters. And it's not because he's right, it's because he's wrong. And strong and wrong is still wrong. Sanctimonious and wrong is still <laughs> wrong. Um, extreme fossil fuel dependency is how we got into this mess. Both the climate crisis and Putin's war and a whole bunch of wars before that. Doubling down on decades of new fossil fuel dependency cannot be the answer. And I agree with my colleague that simply pivoting to petrofascists in Venezuela or Iran uh, makes no sense. We can at least agree on that. But neither does locking in decades of new fossil fuel dependency on the United States and other oil producers at a time when we have a climate crisis and when 
that response um, is going to make things quite profitable for the next petrofascist. As soon as this conflict's over, Vladimir Putin goes right back to getting rich and having the resources to uh, be a global thug or any number of other unsavory regimes that have done the same thing. We've got to get off this treadmill. It's not working for us. And frankly, if, you, if you're serious about confronting Vladimir Putin, don't just repackage the same agenda that the oil and gas industry has been pushing for these past few years. It's not like they were serious about standing up to Putin. They've actually been in bed with Putin over in Russia, developing oil and gas, profiteering from Russian oil and gas, so much so that they can barely figure out how to disentangle themselves from Russia oil and gas right now in a, in a sanctions regime. So uh, let's be serious about that. And by the way, one of Putin's dear friends was our secretary of state under the last regime, uh, the last administration rather, it seemed like a regime. So uh, let's get back to uh, questions because we do need to talk about resiliency and we might as well keep it focused right on the Gulf Coast, right in Louisiana, because that is ground zero. We could talk about other places in California. We've got communities that have no good answer to sea level rise and extreme, an uh, extreme weather. They're gonna be dealing, um, whether they like it or not, with managed retreat. We could talk about places in Alaska and lots of other parts of the country, but uh, Mr. Jewell, you're, your area is as good as any uh, because you're you're really the tip of the spear. And you know, I guess if we could keep the extreme weather and sea level rise from getting a lot worse, maybe through all of these restoration strategies and restoring the function of the Mississippi River Delta and getting back those coastal wetlands and barrier islands and mangroves and everything else, uh, maybe we could stop the loss of all that land that you described and maybe get some of it back for the good people of St. Charles Parish and, and other parts of Louisiana. Uh, and I'm very interested in, in working with you on that and Mr. Graves on that. But what if we don't stop the hemorrhaging? What if we do see two more feet of sea level rise by mid-century? What if we continue to set off carbon bombs uh, that increase our dependency on fossil fuels? and and Dr. Augustine, I'll invite you to talk about this. I read a, a, an op-ed by uh, General Honoré a few weeks ago in the New York Times, and he talked about, you know, it's not just the, the BP uh, oil spill. In the most recent hurricane, there was all sorts of environmental damage from this ubiquitous oil and gas infrastructure. Are we gonna double down on that and not expect more and more and more ecolog ecological damage, let alone the loss of communities and land? So. Um, that's my question to each of you. Um, what if we can't stop it from getting a lot worse? What if we double down on all, all this fossil fuel infrastructure? What's going to happen uh, to that part of Louisiana and other areas in the Gulf Coast? Um, what happens if it doesn't if, if we can't stop it from getting worse? There are that that's a great question. It is the question that we have before us. And I would say that we kind of have to do two things at the same time right now. Um, there are problems today that need solving and we can't, we can't divert all of our attention away from those because people are here right now. At the same time, we do have to look down the road. We have to get past our myopia and think about these questions you're asking. What does, what does it look like on the coasts? with two feet of sea level rise. And what happens to those people who are living there? Um, and so I, I think that, just very quickly, because I, I can see that the clock's going in the wrong way. Um, on the coast, we do have to talk about either, uh, either reinforcements or we have to talk about movement of people. Um, this is a very loaded topic and, and it's very emotionally fraught. Um, this is something that that is it is part of the toolkit. Um, and as far as the infrastructure, there is so much infrastructure um, in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, from the oil and gas enterprise, a lot of its legacy, a lot of it's abandoned, and then there's new stuff coming. And so there's, there's a big pipeline, no pun intended, that we kind of have to work both ends of that. There is a lot of work to be done. Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Um, 
in the case of coastal Louisiana, in the, the sediment starved um, estuaries that we have, if, if we do nothing um, as far as coastal restoration and flood protection goes, then you know, our, our coastline continues to wash away into the sea as it has since the 1930s when the Corps of Engineers uh, levied off the Mississippi River. Uh, and that's why it's incredibly important that we we invest now in, in measures that are going to rebuild the coast. Again, our coastal master plan in Louisiana, which is a $50 billion, 50-year uh, plan, is rooted in science and it's rooted around Louisiana's economy. Uh, so I think that investing in that type that that, that type of plan, uh, restoring that coastline, protecting those shorelines, uh, is the is what we can do now while we look to reach some of our future goals. Thanks, Mr. Uh, next, uh, Representative Palmer, you recognize for five minutes. I thank the uh, gentlelady from Florida and, and for our witnesses appearing today. Um, I'm I've been in, in contact with people in Ukraine by Zoom call, I've had three of these, and we're having this discussion about resilience here. And um, last September, there was an article came out about how uh, Europe's energy policies uh, and our policies has given Putin the upper hand. That was in October of last year. And um, I just wanna point out to my colleagues on this, this committee, you're you're having this discussion about the dangers we face from from your inflated uh, view of, of of climate disasters, uh, inflated, absolutely inflated, uh, and and you're good on inflation, really good on inflation, but uh, there are more people killed in two weeks in Ukraine because of these. I, I won't use profanity. These these policies. Uh, than died in the United States from any natural disaster from 2010 to 2020. Now, I just wonder what your ideas we, we should have been presenting to Ukraine in terms of resilience. You talk about structural damage in the United States, uh, building losses, uh, other infrastructure losses because of natural disasters, and you literally are watching in live television cities being leveled in Ukraine because of the asinine, short-sighted, ineffective energy policies of this country, and particularly this administration and this Congress. And I just wonder what we should be saying to the people of Ukraine, uh, Mr. Jewell. Well, look, I think it's incredibly important, uh, and what we what we're seeing in in Ukraine, it's incredibly important now to to not do an about face on uh, our current energy mix. I think oil and gas is going to be a, a a part of our energy mix now and for years to come. I mean, we, we're only seeing the the demand for energy go up over the next 25, 30, 40 years. Um, so we should be showing the world uh, what needs to be done to invest in an all of the above strategy and show uh, show the world what a what a robust energy economy looks like by uh, div uh, by investing in things like nuclear and renewables and 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 and, and continuing with what we know how to do. Uh, the people in Southeast Louisiana are experts at taking oil and gas out of the ground and doing it safely and cleanly with the best standards in the world. Uh, so we need to make sure that our, our energy policies don't let other countries who don't do things to that high standard and who are not allies of the, the United States uh, pick up that slack. There are now over 2 million refugees from Ukraine uh, flooding the borders of Poland uh, to escape this disaster inflicted upon them by, and I, I mean, it's a number of things. I, I'm, I'm not so... Uh, naive to think that, that Putin might not have tried this, but he certainly wouldn't have, uh, have the resources that he has today to carry out this invasion against Ukraine. I point out that there are more people died in two weeks in Ukraine than died in the entire world from natural uh, disasters in 2020. And you, you pick any random person in the world in the 1920s, and there was a 0.01% chance of dying due to an extreme weather or climate event. Today, 2020, that's 0. 0.00025 percent chance of dying to an extreme as a result of an extreme weather event. Yet we're so wrapped around the axle about about this that it's that it's blinded us to history. It's blinded us to what's actually happening in the world, and we're responsible for it. I, I want to ask. I mean, one of my colleagues mentioned 
the predictions for, for, for these disasters. I'll just uh, read one prediction to you, um, that the greenhouse effect would be, will desolate the heartlands of North America and Eurasia with a horrific drought causing crop failures and food riots. The Platte River in Nebraska would dry up while a continent-wide black blizzard of prairie topsoil will stop traffic on interstate strip paint from houses and shut down computers. Uh, Dr. Augustine, do you, do, you, do you agree that that's going to happen? You're asking me a very hard question. That's, that is, I have no problem saying I'm not really sure. Um, but I, I would say on your fatality um, uh, statistics, we have come a long way in a good way on reducing fatalities to extreme weather. And that is a good thing. Um, I think that it, it says a lot about how far we've come that we are now measuring our losses in terms of assets and I've economic enjoyed, losses. I've enjoyed your testimony because I think you're a serious person and I, and I, I commend you for it. And I just say that that was a prediction by Dr. Michael Oppenheimer in 1990. He predicted it would happen by 1995. And Madam Chairman, I would like to introduce into the record a list of 107 catastrophic predictions that haven't come true. I will take that uh, and review it uh, and dispose of the motion at the end of the hearing. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next up, Representative Escobar. Welcome. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. Thanks for this hearing. Um, you know, it it is, as we talk about, and clearly that's what we're going to talk about mostly today uh, in this hearing, as we talk about the, the crisis that we're facing in Ukraine uh, with a madman who's decided to um, invade uh um, a, a democracy and a, 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 a friend. Um, and we talk about the oil dependency that we have had as a country. I, and, and somebody mentioned the word history. Let's, let's take a look at history. And, and the fact that we are still so dependent and even addicted to fossil fuels. Um, and no one is talking about, no one on the other side of the aisle is talking about how that's been the problem. Some of the same people saying we need to drill more and we need to do more drilling are some of the very same people who have stood in the way of our ability to advance sustainable forms of energy. And so if we had led the way decades ago, as we should have, we would not be in this position where um, we are, are debating these issues. And, and some, one of my colleagues mentioned migration and refugees and, uh, and asylum folks who are, I'm sorry, I, if you don't mind, Representative Graves, I can't hear myself think with your um, talking. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I live on the U.S.-Mexico border, represent El Paso, Texas, and we have seen a record number of refugees, many of them driven by the climate crisis. And so we can talk about a multitude of problems that are fueled by our addiction to fossil fuels, and the answer is not to drill more. The answer is to finally work together, and I hope that we come to a point where Democrats and Republicans alike can work together on renewable energy so that we can finally end this addiction that is at the root of so many of our problems. While um, some of my colleagues want to continue to focus on more drilling, in my community, we don't have that luxury. We are facing record generational drought um, that is eliminating our green valleys. We are living with record heat that is killing people. And so I don't know how we're measuring death and how we're measuring success, but um, I think it, it, all we need is common sense to see that the that the impact is deadly, and um, and we need to act. So in my community, we're working on drafting a framework. I brought together stakeholders who are going to help put together a framework for all our local entities, for the public sector, the private sector, for key stakeholders, on how we begin to find a solution as we go forward in our own community, um, in the absence of real action on Capitol Hill. And, and these climate action plans are really important, um, but they're expensive and they're hard. 
Um, and so, Dr. Hansen, I'm going to to ask you a question. Actually, I, um, you know, we are are working on this framework, as I mentioned, in my community, in my district, that will help be a roadmap, a guide for all, all folks who are wanting to confront the reality ahead of us instead of arguing about whether or not we should de increase our dependency on fossil fuels. Uh, Dr. Hansen, how has the pro the program or how have your programs at EcoAdapt helped environmental justice communities? You know, my, I mentioned how expensive these plans are. I live in an economically disadvantaged community. Also, what are some of the federal policies that we need to enact in order to continue helping communities like mine so that they can manage their risks and adaptation um, and ensure that, that they are acting as quickly as possible? Thank you, Representative Escobar. Um, this is such an important issue. Um, and at the heart of the, the, the points that I brought up earlier, this is why we need a National Climate Extension Service. We need a way to get resources and training to um, members of all communities, especially communities that are dramatically under-resourced, especially communities where there are a disproportionate number of people who will be adversely affected. Um, Coupled with that, again, has to be our ability as a nation to have a national adaptation plan wherein we only spend our funds on things that make us more resilient and better prepared for climate change. That combination of things will ensure that every action we take going forward is an action that is preparing us for the realities of climate change. Um, and uh, as Representative Kasten said, stopping to make hammers that are causing us damage. So if we can have those two pieces, we can provide regular, steady, across the board resources to every community in the United States. Because right now, most communities in the United States do not have the resources, the technical skills, or the bandwidth to make this happen. I worked in communities where quite frankly, having an AmeriCorps volunteer creates their entire capacity to take on this issue. Um, and that's that's not a lot of help and it's a very short period of help. Um, but having that person who can be the lead, who can be asking the questions, if that were also supported by all these other tools I talked about, could really move us forward in a more consistent way. Right now, well-off communities have a better chance of having the resources to hire the staff they need, have access to the data and have access to the resources to make the changes. Uh, but if every dollar we were spending was being spent on things that were climate ready, as opposed to were climate agnostic, uh, we would be doing a better job. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, you'll back. Well, thank you very much members and thank you to our witnesses for their outstanding testimony today. Uh, without objection, I'd like to enter into the record First, a March 2022 letter from the Union of Concerned Scientists outlining their recommendations to the Select Committee on Ways Congress can help advance climate adaptation and resilience. Second, a February 2022 report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Working Group 2 titled Climate Change 2022 Impacts, Adaptation, and Vulnerability Summary for Policymakers, which summarized the report findings and the policy relevant recommendations to address the impacts of climate change on ecosystems, biodiversity, and human communities, and reviews the vulnerabilities, capacities, and limits of the natural world and, and human societies to adapt. Third, a February 2022 report by the National Oceanic, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the U.S. sea level rise and coastal flood hazard scenarios and tool interagency task force entitled Global and Regional Sea Level Rise Scenarios for the United States which analyze sea level rise scenarios out to 2150 and assess flood expo exposure to current conditions for the next 30 years. Oh. Fourth, a January 2022 report by Oliver E.G. Wing et al. titled Inequitable Patterns of U.S. Flood Risk, which examine current and future flood risk under the increasing threat of climate change, including worsening ri risks and impacts to communities of color. Fifth, a February 2022 report by the UN Environment Program titled Spreading Like Wildfire, the Rising Threat of Extraordinary Landscape Fires, which analyzed how climate change and land use change are making wildfires worse across the globe and how the world can better adapt and minimize the risk of wildfires. 
Six, finally, there, there's been a lot of discussion of FEMA's national flood insurance changes. So I'll ask that FEMA's press release from April 2021 announcing the changes is included in the record. And um, uh, Representative- I, I, I object. Okay. Uh, um, Madam Chair, as I mentioned to you once before, in my entire life, I've never heard of a committee not allowing documents to be submitted in the record by unanimous consent until until this committee did it um, last year, I believe. Um, okay, so you, there, was a, there was a there was a there was I'm objecting to everything. You just held Mr. You just held Mr. Palmer's. I was if about you, to. Okay, I if you accept, accept his, his, then then I'll I'll, yeah. I'll lift my objection. Yeah, I was about to accept. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I withdraw my objection. I'm just when you wanted to take a look at it. Uh, because we, we ask everyone to, if they can, to submit it in advance and, and share it with the staff. So, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Do, that's fine. You all, things come up. Thing, no, that. things come up during the hearing, and, and, but we just needed a moment to, to look at it. And so, we, uh, we're also asking unanimous consent for the record for Representative Palmer's letter. And I, I just say that, uh, there is, as as the other items included in the record, as our witnesses testified today, uh, the recent report by the IPCC by Dr. Selecki, there is a lot of current climate science for folks to examine. The consensus is clear, it is deep, that action is urgent. There is a rapidly closing window. Uh, and. I urge everyone, uh, rather than point to decades ago, uh, look at what is right in front of us. Uh, the world's top, top scientists in America's technological edge gives us the ability to look at that and do that. So thanks, everybody. Well, the general lady, you? We'll, we'll yield for a moment. Sure. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, the, my, my friend from California, and he is my friend, uh, Mr. Huffman, who came down to St. Charles Parish and uh, went on an airboat tour to see our coastal problems down there. He, he mentioned a few things that I do think is, is worth getting uh, balanced news into the or information in the record. He said fossil fuel dependency is the problem. Madam Chair, the Biden administration's EIA says that developing countries are going to need between 44 and 80 percent increase in natural gas, that developed countries are going to need uh, between, uh, what is it, 31 and, uh, what is it, 30, 31 to 58 percent for developed countries. They said that you're going to see an increased demand in global energy of 50% over the next 28 years. So, you know what? I too, and I've told you this before, I too would love if we could just make everything magically run on pixie dust. I, I would. But, but right now, that's not possible. The Biden administration says it. So we've shown before that if we stop producing, all that happens is other countries produce, and they do it with greater emissions. We, we can't go devise energy policy strategies that are designed on, on, on nothing, that are designed on pixie dust. We can't do that. Thank you. So, so no, Madam Chair, you just spoke for two minutes without uh, any recognition. I'm just asking for the same courtesy. Go ahead. Well, Madam go ahead, Chair. But we're gonna, so, uh, so, so, Madam Chair, no, every I'm member. I'm going to have order and I'm going to adjourn. I'm going to give yeah. you a little bit Thank you. longer Thank you. to go. But Thank you. Uh, please wrap it Ma up. Madam Chair, every member, every Democrat member of this committee voted against Banning Russian oil. Every member of this Democrat. Yes, it is true. All right. Well, the gentleman. I'll, I'll, I'll I will. Some of the time that he doesn't have. And, and voted against motion to recommit. Voted against my amendments in committee. We, the only president in recent time or, or over the last five years that's reduced emissions is President Trump, not President Biden. So st we've got to stop talking about all these things that are actually doing the opposite of what makes sense for the environment. And, and folks are out there doubling and tripling down on things that have contributed to energy insecurity okay. and greater emissions. All California right. and the European Union are two perfect examples of fatally flawed strategies, and I'm happy to yield my friend. May I? Go ahead and take a moment well, since we're waiting for votes so my to friend be called from, on the floor, but we're going to wrap it up here quickly. Thank you, Madam Chair. You've been very gracious and patient. And uh, my friend from Louisiana uh, you know, maybe forgets that I'm on the same committees as him, so these amendments he's referring to that he describes as a ban on Russian oil I know that they were not that. They were trapdoor amendments that would have stopped some clean energy initiative until someone completed a study of how it helped Vladimir Putin. They were gimmicks. They were not straight. The gentleman has never introduced a straight up ban on Russian oil, but today he'll have a chance to vote on one. So that's the good news. If he's interested in it, uh, let's do it. And describing clean energy as Bigfoots and unicorn 
um, and, and pointing to some hypothetical demand for fossil fuel in the developing world uh, forgets the fact that clean energy is the fastest growing source of new energy in the world on the economics of it. This is not Bigfoots and uni unicorns. And I've told the gentleman that uh, we could also talk to some drug policy experts and they would say there's an almost infinite demand for more fentanyl. Which and we know it'd be right, right, would, right, and we, we know it'd be really bad if we let people get it. But we're not right, powerless. So we're not powerless to change hypothetical demand curves. With that, I Thank yield back. Thank you all again for uh, a robust debate. Uh, look forward to the next committee hearing very much. But thank you again to our witnesses for our hearing today on confronting climate impacts and our, the federal strategies for equitable adaptation and resilience. The committee is adjourned. I got the last word.